So I guess your clubbing days have become more sophisticated now. But many people would take that as an insult. I have a headache. What's、well, going to be your last?、Oh, I have this great idea, but I don't want to tell you about it.、Uh... <laughs> And we are live.、Uh, thank you for tuning into episode 29 of Learn and Laugh Out Loud. My name is Sumar Abro. I'm a business growth and leadership coach and host of this show. Our topic for today's episode is power of lateral thinking for business and beyond. Beyond sounds really interesting to me.、Uh, and when we talk about lateral thinking, you know, the term was first coined in the 60s by Edward Bono. And refers to a person's capacity to address problems by imagining solutions that cannot be arrived via logical means.、Hmm, that makes me think.、Uh, you know, does it mean that creative thinking, out of the box thinking, cannot be taught or learned? In other words,、uh, is there no method to this madness called lateral thinking? Not so fast, because there are ways that we can learn to be creative and bring lateral thinking in our daily lives, business. And personal lives, and to discuss this today, I'm really excited. My guest today is Jamie Taylor. So before I bring her in, let me just briefly tell you about her.、Uh, she's vice president of corporate affairs and protagonist therapeutics. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> a biotechnology company in Silicon Valley. She's also a global justice fellow at Yale University.、Uh, as a global health advocate, she's been part of various initiative, initiatives such as. Global Health Advisory Council at Harvard Medical School, and if this isn't enough,、uh, she has an MBA from Kellogg School of Management and a Master's in Liberal Arts from Harvard University.、Uh, so, so let me kill the surprise and bring her in. Hey, Jamie. Hey, Sumer. How are you? Great to be here today. I'm doing fantastic. I'm so excited about this. Uh, uh, when we、uh, last spoke. Uh, to do something、uh, like this, and you mentioned lateral、uh, thinking, and I just was wow, you know, because this is one of my favorite topics,、uh, and I like to, you know, start on that note. That、uh, amongst all the things that we could have talked about, why why did you choose lateral thinking? For me, it's the thread that guides my entire life on a personal and professional level. For me, I've always been intrigued by the intractable problem, the the infinitely complex, very difficult problem to solve, and I've had a certain kind of romantic view of it. Sometimes entering too optimistically, right?、Um, but as I've developed the skills of lateral thinking, and it does take skill and practice, and we'll talk a lot about that today, I've realized that there are ways to navigate settings so complex. That they seem on their face to overwhelm, but as we can step into them with the lens of lateral thinking, defying logic. To your point earlier, we can achieve breakthroughs that, in many cases, save and improve lives. Perfect.、Uh, and I wanted to actually、uh, get back on something which we were talking、uh, offline.、Uh, before that, I wanted to tell anyone who has tuned in. If you have any question comments on lateral thinking,、uh, please do write them in.、Uh, we will try to include them in our、uh, discussion because that is the whole idea.、Uh, and with this, I wanted to go back to the earlier. You know, you you mentioned such amazing words. You know, lateral thinking and romance. I never even thought of that. You were you were thinking about、uh, an experience at MIT、uh, about problem solving.、Uh, I wanted you to tell the audience about that because you know that was just so beautiful. It just really touched my heart. So about four years ago, I started lecturing at MIT, and what really struck me as I entered that setting was a sort of identity that MIT instills in its students. The MIT culture says we are problem solvers. We look for problems. We seek out problems. We crave problems. We ask. Send us your problems because we are problem solvers. 
We love the process of working through problems. We find excitement there and we improve the world through our identity as problem solvers. What's interesting is that there are MIT professors who will place deliberately into exams problems that have never been solved, not by any expert across the world. And handing these problems to young students is really in a way, it's a way of instilling this identity. And a professor will say to students, we don't expect a perfect answer here. What we want you to realize is the power of the approach, the approach of pro sol problem, problem solving. And as you navigate and elucidate your process, this process is not in vain. As you place it on paper, you are, even where you might run into a brick wall, ultimately contributing to the collective process of solving this problem ultimately. And we believe as problem solvers that these problems ultimately can find a solution. It's an incredible identity to take on. And as you take on this identity, whether an MIT student or a listener here or otherwise, you can find a new power in your life. Problems do not become these frustrating obstacles Instead, they're exciting opportunities to learn, to grow, and most importantly, to contribute. Wow. Wow. I actually just want to shut this podcast and, and, and go solve a few problems <laughs> that I've been thinking about. <laughs> I'm so inspired. I wanted to uh, just pick something from what you said uh, about problem solving. Uh, and um, it's the approach part, right? when it comes to uh, lateral thinking, um, the approach of solving a problem in terms of lateral thinking, how is it different from conventional thinking? Are there any tips or tools that uh, you can talk about? Well, we could spend hours talking through tips and tools. Let's and do it, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it, let's do it. Okay, great. So. So um, having put myself in a lot of positions of, of extreme difficulty, working all around the world, I mean, whether it's Durban, South Africa, working on access to medicines for HIV patients or, or sorting out environmental challenges in garment factories in Vietnam, I've had the opportunity to participate in problem solving exercises where again, a, there, the sense of overwhelm can really become its own sort of cloud. And speaking of clouds, there's one particular exercise that is a first go-to and really lateral thinking. I mean, at its most basic form, it's creative problem solving, looking beyond sort of an immediate logic, right? Or ready logic, but really stretching, widening a lens. And there are lots of different lenses that we can pull from in a lateral thinking exercise. I have probably, you know, a dozen that we could walk through today. A real favorite is blue sky, gray sky. So as kind of a born uh, optimist, I've often found myself on the blue sky side, right? And then you, then as you step into really believing this can be solved and maybe it's a simple A to B, right? Maybe there is just this, an, an uncovering process that needs to happen A to B. A lot of times it's more complex than that, right? And there are a lot of layers to uncover and a lot of risks that you know this ready optimist side doesn't always appreciate. So I've worked with teams in the past, you know, really is a, almost a first run in lateral thinking to pursue blue sky, gray sky. So the blue sky piece, as you can probably guess, is that high opportunity, really big vision, sort of best case scenario. This is this is really fun. This is your laugh out loud meeting, right? Where you get to just you know, if this, then this could happen. And you get to play with this brainstorming almost to the nth degree with this real excitement and energy. A lot of times for blue sky meetings, we'll bring the people we know who are the most driven optimists who really only see the bright side. And they can bring so many ideas to the table with that lens. But it's not the only lens that's relevant or valid. And as it, there was a time when I pursued only blue sky meetings and only blue sky colleagues, right? But what I didn't always appreciate was the gray sky dimension and how important that is. And the fact that there's a creati creativity element there as well. 
So there's the possibility of bringing together people who maybe oftentimes are very seasoned, who run into a lot of brick walls and trying to solve the same problems before, who can shed a lot of light on downside risk, or who can really keep you from that sort of failure of imagination problem that creates its own barriers, right? So pulling together sort of a gray sky group is um, for has been for me very illuminating. Well, if you tried this, then this could happen. Or have you considered this dimension or the new problem you create via this? And there's an eye-opening aspect to that that becomes very powerful, realizing that that the the likely outcome is probably somewhere between blue sky and gray sky. And both dimensions have a lot of validity. So blue sky, gray sky can be put into practice in a lot of different ways. You can have the same group and force a blue sky, gray sky dynamic. Great idea on the blue sky side. Now we're gonna push you to toggle, tell us the gray, side, the gray sky scenario, right? So you can do that with the same group to force what Edward de Bono, who's really the father of lateral thinking, constantly pushed for any team. That's don't fall in love with your ideas immediately. Your, your, you, your primary objective is to generate many ideas commensurate with the multidimensionality of any problem. And if, you, if you're romancing, to use that word again, your own ideas or finding a dominant idea right off the bat and becoming a preacher around that or a prosecutor against anyone who might offer an alternative, then you're losing the spirit of lateral thinking. So to force that sort of toggle in an organizational context, it really helps create the right level of detachment that can, that, that can in turn create space for more creativity, which is, again, the spirit and the heart of lateral thinking. Also, there's, you know, there's value in starting off with blue sky and spending, say, a defined period of time and then going to gray sky and then toggling back to blue sky, right? Or maybe neutral sky as you work to, to resolve it. Either way, this is an incredible exercise to really ground a team, to really anchor a team in understanding many different sides of an equation, many different sides of a problem. And that alone becomes a driver of lateral thinking and help can help instill a culture of lateral thinking as you approach a problem from there. Very cool. So I just wanted to uh confirm with you so that anyone who's tuned in and listening when we talk about uh, the blue sky and and the gray sky so in layman's terms blue sky is more con conventional solution to a problem and gray sky is something which has not been maybe tried and tested before and maybe more risky is, does that make sense well, in some ways, it's more kind of optimist versus pessimist in a way, right? And so, you know, my my impulse, I mean, to, to draw from your words, like my convention would be to assume best case, right? right. To assume best conditions. And, it, and blue sky will often run on that assumption, right? But the gray sky can introduce the element of complexity that you need to understand a problem in its fullness. And sometimes the blue, blue sky instinct, as much as I identify with it, can sort of gloss over those tricky pieces that can un end up tripping up a solution as you attempt to implement it in the real world. So having both dimensions gives you those two lenses and lateral thinking requires at least two lenses. That's the spirit of it, right? It's multiple lenses, multiple tools, multiple ways of seeing a problem, which can generate multiple solutions. It makes makes perfect sense and actually uh, i just wanted to uh build up on that and uh, anyone who is tuned in uh, we're talking about lateral thinking we're talking about problem solving and we are getting more into uh you know all kind of different contexts uh so per so personal lives organizational setting and what you just said jamie uh, i wanted to actually explore one of the areas uh, that you mentioned so being an optimist and pessimist, right? So, so perfect example is, you know, you, you are in an organization setting, right? And, and uh, you have this crazy wacky idea to solve a problem or, you know, or at least 
at least uh, other people will think that it's a crazy idea. In your mind, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great idea, right? <clears throat> so when that happens, um, when you have a solution which is not conventional, which is out of the box, which you re really do not have a lot of evidence to back that up in an organizational setting. What do you recommend, you know, when when you go, because it happens a lot of times, you know, you you, you are excited, you go in and pitch your idea and, and you, you fall flat on your face, uh, face. So what would you recommend anyone who wants to have out of box ideas in an organization setting? What would their approach be when they go and pitch that idea? Are there any uh, suggestions for that? Sure. So I'll I'll kind of point to two pillars here. Okay. One goes back to what Edward De Bono really emphasized that I just touched on in the in the last comment. He said you have to engage to be an, a lateral thinker. You have to engage constantly in dominant idea extraction. And the acronym there is DIE, right? So it's the kill your darling sort of sort of impulse. The idea is that you have to be keenly self-aware when you're going through the process of problem solving. That it, it that way where, where you recognize whether in yourself or in a team setting, where you recognize a dominant idea emerging and really taking over and being seen as a sole solution that everyone's rallying behind with a sense of immediacy. That's where you have to be self-aware enough to actually take it off the table and set it aside and force yourself to come up with other ideas, other options, other approaches. To me, there's a brilliance to this because a lot of times, especially in organizational settings, thinking about big corporations where you're going in to pitch an idea, you become so attached to it that sometimes it shuts you out from the spirit of lateral thinking, which is gathering input from others. And that points to that second pillar that I referenced really seeing every criticism as an opportunity for an idea. Beneath every point of criticism is probably an idea ready to hatch. So embracing that criticism, right? In the spirit of embracing problems where criticism has come your way, that's its own problem, right? Or a sub problem. Going to those who lob a critique and inviting them to participate in ideation with you. Let's find the idea that is lurking underneath this criticism. It, it almost that gray sky dynamic, right? Let's right, see how right. we can match it up with this idea and build a hybrid potentially. That's where you find breakthroughs. That's that connecting of dots. It's the strange bedfellows effect as De Bono talks about so much in his early work that really puts lateral thinking into motion in ways that can help a, a, probably a good idea that you're attempting to pitch really reach that next level. And that's where you get the buy-in effect, certainly in large corporations or other types of organi organizational settings. Beautiful. And I just wanted to uh, add on to what you said. You used the word criticism, right? It's a powerful, powerful word. And why I'm saying this is a lot of times when it comes to out of the box thinking, lateral thinking, uh, and we go in and we want to pitch our ideas. Uh, and obviously then there's feedback, right? Uh, and as, as much as we like to say that feedback is really important, I hate feedback and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Not because feedback is a bad thing because a lot of times uh feedback is is not constructive it's pointing towards uh, the issue but not pointing towards a solution that's a but why feedback is important and you mentioned criticism is when it comes to lateral thinking when it comes to coming up with out of the box ideas we have to be 10 times in terms of preparation level uh when we go in and we want to pitch our ideas, uh, we have to be 10 times more prepared so that people can understand where we're coming from uh, and why that idea will work, A. Uh, because a lot of times I, I see when people, you know, they have this idea which is creative and all of that, 
you get so boxed into that idea that you forget that the people who are listening in, you know, they're not just, not just going to buy your idea. Uh, so I think it's really critical for all of us to understand that if you if you have an idea which is unconventional, you really have to get into that romantic mode, as you mentioned. Uh, and, and when 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 you're romancing with something, then amazing reasons come to you when it comes to convincing other people. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that there. Secondly, I wanted to just add on to what you just said. Anything that we do, uh, and and be it in our personal lives or in an organization setting, adding the economic value to your idea always works wonders. You know, as much as sometimes we do not like it, right? Um, and I see a lot of times uh, we fail to uh, add in the economic factor to anything that we pitch. Sure, anything that you want to do will improve lives or do these wonderful things. But a lot of times when it comes to, let's say, for example, pitching to investors, uh, if there is no economic value, what happens? Nothing, right? You're absolutely right. And that's part of, I mean, when I think of gray sky, a, a lot of my gray sky right. colleagues have been economists or those who are kind of quantifying benefit, right? And it goes to, I think, something deeper in the lateral thinking approach in business and in life. And that's a principle you can put in practice every single day. And that's democratizing the process of problem solving, seeking input from every single angle. One of the great lateral thinking leaders that I've worked with in the past was someone named Michelle C.D. Bay, who worked for the United Nations and led UN AIDS. And people would say before you met him, you need to know he's a lateral thinker. And the moment you meet him, he will ask you to help him solve the greatest problems that sit in front of him. He will ask people on the street for their input. Every taxi driver who drives him to the airport has an opportunity to shape UN policy with respect to HIV AIDS because he asks for it. He sees the potential creative ideation in every being around him, even where they where they might be his greatest detractors and critics. And if you can bring that ultimate lens of lateral thinking to the way that you approach everything, that's where you can build this collective buy-in because you're not wedded to your idea, but you're constantly allowing it to evolve based on the input of many other people from many other walks of life, including those who would affix certain values to it or suggest an adjustment to the value that your idea might ultimately might ultimately provide. And so being that kind of ultimate listener and ultimate asker, that it's that is a principle of lateral thinking that adds an entire dimension of power and connection to absolutely everything that you do. Very cool. And, you know, we have a few uh, questions which have come in. And Great. Uh, so I wanted to uh, throw in a question from our audience in the mix. And I think it has to do some something with your last example. So we have Adam from Australia. Uh, he's asking, his question is, well, it's long. Let me see if I can rephrase it. Uh, the question is, how important is uh, your uh, organizational culture when it comes to uh, lateral thinking? How, how, what kind of role does uh, organizational culture play in lateral thinking? I think this is everything. And sometimes you're working against a very challenging organizational culture. I think of large companies that I've worked in and with. And something that almost defines the culture is... A, a fear of stepping even toward a problem to solve it, because where you might propose a solution or become in any way affiliated with a problem, then somehow you might be held accountable for it, or you might be held responsible for it, where the outcome is imperfect. So what I would see often was a case where a problem might arise, let's say in a specific operating company or operating environment, and certain or there would be a large sort of peanut gallery that would gather, right? And there would be very few people willing to step up 
and step into problem solving mode. And where those few people might arise, there was something that was um, not so affectionately termed walking the plank, right? And so organizational culture can be hugely detrimental to problem solving. And what you get is this sort of perpetuation and magnification of problems that don't even come out in explicitly in meetings or in other in leadership settings because of this sense of fear of accountability or fear of affiliation. So there are two specific exercises that I and other colleagues have undertaken that have had profound effects to work counter to this sort of culture. And I'm sure many of you on the line have come up against this sort of peanut gallery, but you know, the sense that a problem may be so radioactive that it presents certain risks to even begin to address. One is called the radical responsibility exercise. Okay. This is a hard one for any team to pursue. And often we would bring an external facilitator to sort of playfully walk us through this, right? And it starts with the outrageous. You have to practice taking radical responsibility for something. You have to find a way to explain that you are responsible for the rainfall from the clouds this morning in St. Cloud, Minnesota. You have to find a way that you are responsible for events taking place in, in Bucharest, Romania this afternoon or the protests there that's happening, right? I mean, there. Are, this is an outrageous sort of exercise, but if you can inch people into the exercise of taking radical responsibility, even where there's no logic associated with it, and when there's really no risk to taking that responsibility, you can start to move a team into this frame. And what I've found is as you, as you inch toward, through these pre-exercises, as you inch toward and then leap toward real problems that your organization is grappling with internally or externally, the radical responsibility exercise becomes the most profound and most powerful exercise because you're shifting a culture you're looking at taking responsibility as a privilege. Hopefully you've got leaders in the room who are providing that additional layer of protection as part of a radical responsibility exercise. Then you can assemble the right team to really work toward and manage something thorny and complex and difficult. Radical responsibility is truly the most powerful exercise I've ever undertaken. When I was introduced to it, it was mind blowing for me, having been steeped in a culture where, well, that's not my scope. That's, oh, that's outside of my role. Oh, like, you know, I, I wouldn't be the one to take that on. And as I started stepping up and stepping up and really joyfully walking onto the plank, I was able to, I mean, really work. And I would describe it not just as breakthroughs, but miracles for the organization. And so that's one exercise to consider. Another is what an exercise that I pursued with teams called beneath and out of, right? To be able to start managing problems that are in the midst of an organization, again, internally or externally, it helps to be able to start explicitly defining a problem. I love it when people stop a meeting and say, what problem are we trying to solve here? I mean, we hear that sometimes, not enough probably in meetings, but it forces a discussion around the problem itself. When you play beneath and out of, you start delayering, asking what is the problem beneath the problem? And if we let this problem fester, then what problems might grow out of this problem? So I'll give you an example. So I was working with an, op well, I was working or notified, let's put it that way, not yet kind of agreed to, to kind of sign on, but notified of a problem while I was in the, in the a very large organization with an operating company in Canada that had found itself in a very tough conflict with the government agency there that manages pricing and access to, to medicines, right? Okay. And things had become so tense that it seemed like it had become an intractable problem in and of itself. On its face, the problem was that the agency would not allow 
preferred pricing for this particular drug and would not provide patient access to this drug. But there was a problem beneath the problem. And that was a very sour relationship between our company and that agency. And there was a relationship issue that had to be addressed. This kind of perfunctory pricing issue, I mean, that could be managed at some point, you know, maybe through just the course of normal negotiations. But we had created a, a, a sort of pool beneath it that of toxicity, again, taking responsibility there, that meant that if we didn't handle the problem beneath the problem, out of that problem was going to grow major difficulties for the organization in terms of everything coming out of our pipeline. So we started applying lateral thinking and asking ourselves, how do we repair the relationship? And that was such an illuminating process coming to the real problem and then forecasting a problem ahead. A lot of organizational cultures won't create the space for that, right? They simply, you know, it's kind of you whack-a-mole every problem at a time while the whole machine is breaking down, right? right? And so we were able to do that. And through the power of lateral thinking, we put our solution caps around repairing the relationship with the government of Canada. We pursued partnerships with the government of Canada across very, let's just say, indirectly associated agencies outside of this particular agency where we had the immediate problem. We were able to forge partnerships with the government that created whole programs around preventing preterm births in Bangladesh and Mali, for example. We worked with the international development cohorts. We, we took a, a sort of cap of nobility on at, with an emphasis on relationship repair. And within two years, the relationship with that government across the board, and not just with that agency, but including that agency, had improved remarkably. But if we had only tackled that pricing issue as the sole problem and not pursued that beneath and out of exercise, then we may have let our own sort of short-sighted culture take over and let the company spiral into many problems downstream. So those are just two exercises that, again, can be approached very playfully, even in high stakes environments that are really meant to unlock creativity, especially in the face of larger corporate cultures that typically don't allow for those sorts of deeper conversations and exercises. But again, where you can where you can put those into motion, radical responsibility and beneath and out of, you can bring that power of lateral thinking into play and exercise real leadership and impact. Makes perfect sense. I mean, can you believe that, you know, when it when it comes to solving this particular example and problem you talked about, um, we you had to go back to uh, you know, fixing that relationship part of the issue, right? Uh, which you mentioned uh, in this whole uh, example. And um, yeah. so, Adam, if you're listening, uh, hopefully you got a couple of great ideas. And I think, as Jamie mentioned, you know, what was the first uh, response? Jamie mentioned radical response thinking. R radical responsibility. Right. Radical responsibility, right? Um, so try those out and um, uh, and see where it takes you. We have a couple of more uh, questions coming up, but just uh, based on what you just said, you know, uh, uh, not just looking at the surface level of uh, the problem, uh, because uh, a lot of times we just want to see the problem and come up with a quick fix right so i wanted to um, uh, share an example uh, with everyone who's tuned in and it's something you might have read of and and i love this uh, example and it's it's based on a famous uh, you know elevator story uh, which cautions problem solvers out there not to just jump on solving a problem Till you really understand the problem. Uh, and there are many versions of the story. Uh, the short version is that uh, in a hotel, the guests were complaining that the elevator is too slow, right? So naturally, the first thing to do is to speed up the elevator. Uh, but guess what? There was no budget to spend on the elevator, and uh, the hotel manager didn't know what to do. 
Eventually, they solved the problem by installing a TV and mirrors in the elevator, right? So the complaint stopped. So how, how, how did that solve the problem of the elevator being slow? Well, as I think Jamie also uh, mentioned in her example previously, it's about firstly reframing the question, right? Uh, so the first step uh, is to move from not just what is the problem, but why is the problem there? And that begins with asking a few questions. I remember in my work with one of the organizations, which used to be painful, but <laughs> at the end of it, you know, we, we came out as better individuals. It's uh, asking the question, why a few times? So on this elevator problem, uh, the problem was that, uh, you know, it, it made people wait. So the natural approach was to reduce the wait time and speed the elevators. Well, we cannot do that. Okay, so then let's look at the problem again. People don't like to wait. So, okay, so we cannot spend the money to fix the elevators and speed them up. So how about we make their wait time more pleasant? So how do we do that? The solution is let's improve the surroundings. Uh, so how do we improve the surroundings? Well, we can entertain them somehow. And that's what they did. Uh, they put music and, uh, sorry, TV and mirrors in the elevator. And uh, as we all know, we all like to, you know, look at ourselves. Uh, and that's one of the ways to spend time and uh, watch TV. And uh, sooner than you think, the complaints just stopped. Uh, so that's the simplest way to uh, look at lateral thinking. And when it comes to problem solving is uh, move from the what of the problem to why of the problem. How does it make people feel? And hopefully you will get some uh, interesting ideas. And just to sum it up, you know, uh, I think one of the best examples of lateral thinking is Henry Ford. If he wouldn't have reframed the question of his potential customer, he would have wasted his life building a faster horse, right? Uh, and we wouldn't have uh, had assembly lines for uh, mass uh, production. So that's another way of looking at <laughs> lateral uh, thinking. What do you think, Jamie? I think you're absolutely right. In fact, I had I, in my notes to bring up Henry Ford. So we're very much on the same plane with that. And I think um, we have to recognize that as lateral thinkers, as problem solvers, it's really incumbent upon us to really drive that questioning, really reframing questions to help define the problem better. There are lots of exercises that really force questions. When you relieve people of the burden of providing a ready answer and allow for that questioning, so many solutions can come forward as a next step result. We used to play a game, we called it the Derrida exercise named after Jack Derrida, who's this famous structural linguist who said there's nothing outside the text. That was his idea that the answer to all of all meaning is somehow hidden within the words before you again being a structural linguist so we used to place i mean just a mundane phrase in front of a group biopharmaceutical access right and we'd say you can only use the letters on the whiteboard find the questions and from the questions we'll find the solutions and people would raise their hands and say as I look backwards here, I see the word late. Maybe we're presenting this medicine in the treatment paradigm too late. Someone else would raise their hand and say, I see Mac in that word. And it reminds me of my friend Mac, who died of kidney disease after he had as a complication of this particular disease state. Maybe we aren't thinking about nephrology as a particular aspect of this. As you constrain, remember creativity loves constraints. Marissa Meyer from Yahoo sure. and Google used to say this constantly. So where you can place constraints and fun to your points around the question asking exercise, then you relieve that pressure. You relieve the duress associated with so much problem solving and you put your organization, your team in a place of bright lateral thinking creativity that can unlock, as I said, real breakthroughs and even miracles for your organization. Woohoo! Awesome. Awesome. Uh, we, you know, I have a couple of more questions and there's there's another question from the audience which I'd like to uh, ask you. Uh, but from our conversation and what you just talked about, 
uh, I've often wondered uh, because when it comes to creativity, when it comes to lateral thinking, and you know, I have lived in a lot of different countries. I have lived in the developing world, the developed world. World. One of the things uh, which really fascinates me about creative thinking, lateral thinking, is in a lot of uh, the developing world people come up with a lot of creative solutions, right? And as, as you mentioned that creativity demands constraints, right? If you have abundance, it just doesn't happen. But, but the, he, 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 here's the thing I wanted to uh, share with you and I wanted to see what your thoughts are. Uh, United States, you know, uh, the largest economy in the world. Uh, everything is in abundance. Uh, and if you don't believe me, go check out people's garages. You'll find out. Uh, we have so much junk. Uh, when it, on individual level, when you talk about lateral thinking, out of the box thinking, you see a lot of that stuff happening in a lot of developing world. But as a collective, I still do not see any other country uh, as a whole, coming up with these fascinating new ideas, which are not just creative, uh, but they are also financially viable. You know, case in point, look look at the tech world uh, in the last uh, many years or so. Look at Google, Facebook, all these companies. The, the, you know, the birthplace is this country, right? I mean, are there any specific reasons that, you know, um, United States having so much everything in abundance still comes out with these amazing lateral thinking creative ideas which are just financially viable also I mean is, is there a, do you have any thoughts on that sure so I'm sitting here in the hub of Silicon Valley yes, and you, are. you can see I don't have the, the most innovative background here in my <laughs> office but what it's a reminder of is the fact that creativity the conditions for creativity have to be created within constantly, right? The external environment doesn't always, even in Silicon Valley here, doesn't always lend itself to creativity. So it's this constant mode and push. And I think, you know, it's certainly the US was founded on certain principles. And I think of some of the greatest lateral thinking leaders in history, Thomas Jefferson certainly comes to mind for it, just his brilliant ability to connect dots. He was as interested. I mean, if you look, if you visit Monticello ever and have the opportunity to tour. I actually party, have. I actually oh, it's have. fantastic. And you see this polymath at play, right? Who was fascinated with how peas would grow inside a plant at the same time, so fascinated with democratic systems of government and how to stand those up. And at the same time, fascinated with religious freedom and how that might be exercised in this new context. Constant dot connecting, I think is very important. For all of the, the strain that our company has around polarization, I still think it's a place of diversity. And I still believe in at least a history of the melting pot. And I certainly believe in the future of multiplicity of ideas and this at least democratic sort of cauldron where ideas can, can and can be nurtured but also connected certainly there's that capital component that gives life to ideas that is that missing piece in many ways in the developing world although that's changing and i think we see we see a privileging of ideas and especially Silicon Valley, there's no stigma associated with failure. And people will say that's the major difference between <laughs> Silicon Valley and maybe other places. There's no stigma. People will, will wear failure, so to speak, right? As, as a badge of pride, as a step toward learning. And really lateral thinking is all about that, learning from every angle, studying from every angle, multidimensionality, multiplicity of ideas, multiple sources of input and driving and driving it that way. And my hope having worked globally is that this spirit will truly extend globally. I've seen working with MIT, I've had the opportunity to participate now in several hackathons that are by design global. And this is where you get that constraint around creativity. Three days, seemingly intractable problems. One, for example, was uh, how to bring cancer care to the most remote communities in the world and the level of energy drive, but especially diversity of thought 
all match together and mesh together in a finite period of time, what comes out of those settings is nothing short of amazing. And if we can think in our organizations, especially some of those you referenced, those sort of stayed, you know, um, organizations really striving for innovation, but locked by their own bureaucracies and to some extent legacies, sure. where we can bring that spirit of truly global reach and global collection of input and feedback. And we're, you know, we're seeing some of the tools emerge for that now efficiently through AI and so forth. We will be better as organizations and again, better contributors across the board and also better positioned to nurture ideas wherever they might originate. Fantastic, fantastic. And uh, you know what you just uh, uh, mentioned uh, in terms of uh, you know organizations, right? So, so, so in my work with a lot of all kinds of businesses, all shapes and sizes, you know, every every s small uh, business wants to act or become like big business, right? Uh, because uh, you want to have the systems and the processes in place. And every big business you talk to, they want to be like small business, right? So I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, the grass is always uh, greener on the other side. And just wanted to add on to what you just uh, mentioned, uh, you know, as an immigrant in this country, I think one of the things, uh, uh, you know, United States has the institutions, uh, some of the best schools that, you know, you've mentioned um, and all those things. Right. The list is endless. <clears throat> to me, I think what really fosters uh, or the environment which is so conducive to uh, lateral thinking or uh, thinking out of the box uh, are really like small but huge cultural differences so 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 case in point uh, in this country when when you're born yeah uh, you know you you are told that you can be the president of this country that that rarely happens in a lot of other countries and i can tell you from my personal experience number one uh so so sky's the limit or the beginning you know whichever you prefer um secondly i think one of the things which i really appreciate about living here is the informality of uh, interactions. Um, I think that has to do a lot with uh, opening your mind and accepting diversity. Um, you know, very quick example I just want to share. It might not have to do with uh, lateral thinking, uh, but some of the other people uh, from different parts of the world who have migrated to, you know, uh, somewhere in Europe, and, and I hear this one person, he told me, he, and, and, and this story is so touching to me. He said, do you know what is the difference uh, when you immigrate to the United States or some of the other country? I'm like, uh, I, I can give you many reasons. He says one of the primary differences, and I don't want to mention a country or anything, that, you know, I've lived in that country for 30 years, but I still feel sometimes like I'm an outsider. Mm -hmm. Right? Here in this country, I think from the word go, if you are genuine, if you can do what you say and say what you do, no one cares really. Uh, you know, if, if I were to speak collectively, you know, you have your uh, an incident here and there. And, and to me, that that is really powerful. Uh, being informal, uh, you know, when I came to study here a long time back, I saw my college professor in the evening riding a bike in shorts and, and, and a tank top. I was like, I would never see a professor in my afraid of, you know, people judging them. You know, does that make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. It, you, you just gave me lots of visions of Nobel Prize winners in Cambridge, <laughs> Massachusetts that I've seen in their pajamas, unshaven at, at Whole Foods, right? I mean, uh, the, I think you're right about this sort of this informality that, that governs sort of presentation and connection and bringing it back to lateral thinking, it ties into that sort of collective input, wisdom of crowds, pulling in ideas and the opportunity to bounce ideas, if you will, right? Against anyone, wherever they might be, seeing validity in the input of everyone around you and not dividing or excluding on the basis of class or origin. I think there's, there's, there's something when we think about the best of what our country is and can be, it points to exactly what you expressed. Cool, cool. All right, Jamie, I have 
one more question from the audience and, okay. and then, then we'll go towards some of uh, uh, the fun question I'm going to ask you, uh, which I've been holding back. Usually I ask them in the middle, but our conversation has been so fluid. So I, I totally forgot. Uh, so you don't have to be afraid. You know, okay. you know they're just silly, fun questions. But before that, uh, we have uh, Leah. And she writes, uh, I am interested in exploring different ways to collaborate, build, and lead teams to solve problems. I'm looking forward to learning more about how lateral thinking can help people. And this is, I think, the punchline. How lateral thinking can help people get out of ruts. Any thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. And it really goes to the spirit of your whole podcast. And by the way, Sumer, everything that you're doing it's such a gift. It's such a contr contribution of huge value. I think to everyone as we navigate probably a moment of collective problem solving and problem kind of sitting in some ways as, we, as we're in this moment of time that seems, again, very overwhelming to think about sort of the nature of the problems that, that we started off discussing. And so we're at this we're we're at this moment, I think, where a lot of people are feeling that sense of overwhelm, the sense of weight, and it's driving a lot of teams into ruts. I think sometimes it's about pulling that forward and acknowledging it as a first point of order, acknowledging very explicitly the challenges that everyone is bearing externally, and also really bringing this sort of identity back to what we talked about at the beginning when you step into MIT as a student being told this is the the identity that we have as a collective as a culture of problem solving and it really is very empowering where we where some of these larger problems in the world may seem out of reach there are these small finite problems within our own reach and our own scope and our own lives that we really can begin to tackle in the spirit of being problem solvers so that's a second piece as well i think bringing the element of play uh to the point you know, around everything that you do with your podcast i mean the spirit of liveliness of enthusiasm the spirit of play can do a lot to lift burdens i think in a lot of corporate contexts pressure is the name of the game. You force teams to work under duress and sometimes it's artificially manufactured where you can create the context, the conditions for play and creativity and lift that pressure. You can find that people bring their own measure of genius to the table that you've never seen before. Another is simply role play. Let's imagine as a group, that we're in a completely different time. Let's say 2020 without the pandemic or 1955, right? I mean, imagine yourself in a totally- That would be something. <laughs> and that allows, that lifts pressure in its own right, right? Or imagine that we're our own kind of special who's who from history and we all come to the table in the spirit of play as different figures. Sumer is Thomas Jefferson. I'm you know, Mary Curie, right? I mean, really, and, and come with that sort of frame and that sort of thinking style, give people that fun sort of homework and allow them to kind of step out of their day to day and take off the masks of who, of, of what they feel like they have to be in that corporate context or team context and allow them to play with different identities, kind of in the spirit of Ronald Heifetz's work, the, the many faces of leadership allow people to take on different faces of leadership through the exercises that you put in place. And then, of course, everything that we talked about today, blue sky, gray sky thinking can pull people out of a rut very fast. Even where gray sky, where you approach it playfully, it can actually be a lot of fun. Where you do dominant idea extraction so that nobody feels pressured to be wedded to a, a dominant idea, set it to the side and let's keep brainstorming. Beneath and out of can be so powerful as you as a team are allowed to go deeper. There are very few times in life where, especially under tight deadlines and meeting, you know, meeting calendars, where you're really allowed to go deep. So lead your team there. And as you go deeper, you'll find that you elevate. And then all of the fun creativity constraints you know, and, and working within those, you'll find that as you put some of these exercises into practice, you will uncover insights, but even better, you will deepen a relationship with a team 
where they find that you can see and bring out the very best in them and you've created the conditions for that. And again, there's something very powerful and all of it draws upon the principles of lateral thinking. Wow. Thank you so much, firstly, for those lovely compliments. I don't know if you've noticed, my head has grown. It is already <laughs> huge. Uh, so thank you for those uh, kind words. And uh, I think uh, in your uh, reply to the question, uh, and hopefully, Leah, you have tuned in and you've been listening in. I think you mentioned the play part, uh, which is so critical. Um, often, um, and uh, I don't want to stereotype, but often I see a lot of people who love golf and they will stay in their miserable jobs waiting for the weekend to play golf. Uh, and, you know, I, I cannot stand golf, but I you know I love other sports. Uh, and I, I have this theory. I don't know how it, it's, it's I, I don't have any scientific validation behind it, that uh, a lot of people who who love what they do, they really don't wait for the weekends to do something else. Uh, you know, I've never, I've, I've, I've heard accountants say that, you know, they're waiting for the weekend so they can play their guitar. But I have never met a guitar player who says that, okay, I'm waiting for the weekend to, so I can do accounting. Uh, you know, so if, if that kind of uh, makes sense. So the play part is really important. Uh, and, you know, some of these silly examples that I just gave, um, you know, play, play, play is also serious business. Uh, just like I think that fun is serious business. A lot of times we meet people who are spontaneous, who have these great one liners or have gift of the gab. And what I've also noticed and learned from a lot of these individuals uh, is that uh, people who are spontaneous, are, uh, they, they practice being spontaneous. Right. Uh, it's about telling a joke, you know, uh, maybe the first time you were not good at it. Second time you got better. Third time, like, OK, I nailed it. So so play. So what I mean to say is what you mentioned, Jamie, play fun is serious business with with anything you do in organizations. If it's fun, it's play. If it leads to something which is really helpful, you know, then there's a, always a good feeling. You know, you have probably attended a lot of workshops uh, where uh, a facilitator will come in and they'll do a fun activity, right? Uh, and a, a lot of times you will meet facilitators who are able to connect that fun activity with the purpose of the workshop, right? And there are other times that you will do that fun activity, but th that has nothing to do with the entire day, right? And you're like, why did we do that, right? So um, in a nutshell, that's uh, what I wanted to add uh, that, you know, uh, Play is important, uh, growth is important, uh, but it has to have a meaning. And, and that's where the challenge, I think, comes in, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, figuring out how to make play relevant at workplace. Uh, and uh, any of you who are listening out there, please reach out to me or Jamie um, and, and we'll pick your brains because, you know, we love to talk, uh, but we also like to listen, right, Jamie? Absolutely. That's key to lateral thinking, as we've discussed. That is uh, key to lateral thinking. So we are about uh, running out of time. But uh, before I let you go, uh, I'm going to ask you uh, a few fun, silly questions and, and see if, if, if you're wearing your lateral thinking hat. Are, are you ready, Jamie? I'm not sure if I'm ready, but if we can go for it. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, so so let's uh, let's start with something really simple. What is the most obnoxious, weirdest thing one can do on their first date? Uh, pick a nose. <laughs> yeah, that would be obnoxious plus uh, really unhygienic. So, so I'm with you there. Okay. Second question: uh, What is your fa favorite angry word? I don't know if I can say it. On this. <laughs> Okay. Shoot. <laughs> okay, okay. That's uh, that's very PG thirteen. So so I'll accept that. Okay. Uh, last two questions. Um, if you ever met met Kim Kardashian, what would you say to her? I actually met her in the airport one time. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> All right, I finally meet someone who has met her. Did, what did you say to her? Well, I said, I'm sorry, because I had a three-year-old son who was climbing up onto her lap without, without any sense of her celebrity. But this is the serendipity we find in life, right? You know, she was very graceful about it and wonderful. Yeah, she is. She is. A lot of times what we see on screen or, you know, the internet does not really define a person. So, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay, last question, and this is something I ask everyone who comes on this show, right? Uh, if heaven exists, and when you arrive at the pearly gates, what do you want God to say to you? I want him to say thank you, and I want him to give me the opportunity to thank everyone who's made a difference in my life. Awesome, beautiful. Well, You've included Sumer. It's just wonderful being associated with you. I'm oh, absolutely you. thrilled to be here. And I wouldn't prefer to be any other place than here today. So thank you for setting this up. No, thank you for uh, taking out the time. Uh, so we have run out of uh, time. Uh, but just hang on for a few seconds. I'm just going to uh, exit the, uh, the podcast. I just want to chat with you for a couple of minutes. Anyone who has... Uh, uh, tuned in um, and was brave enough to listen to us. Thank you so much. Hope you learned and also uh, laughed a little bit with us. If you have any questions or uh, qu queries, please uh, uh, reach out to us. And this is a goodbye from us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.